Well, good morning, everybody. Uh, I hope you are safe and warm uh, sitting at home, and thank you so much for, for joining us this morning online uh, here at Christchurch Midrand. Uh, I, I want to give you just a little bit of insight into Willem's uh, story. Uh, the excitement of Zoom and taking just 30 seconds to, to get from his bed to his desk in the mornings, instead of spending 60 minutes in his car in the traffic, all of that has started to wear off a little bit for, for, for Willem. Uh, he longs to be back at work uh, in the open air office with the team of people that, that he works with. Uh, he misses the banter and the brainstorming sessions, uh, solving problems together, uh, basically just getting things done together as a group of people. It's just not the same when you're on Zoom. He loves being part of the team. They're, they're all such amazing people uh, in their own way, they're different ages, uh, different cultures, different backgrounds but they're all in incredibly talented people, friendly, uh, and they support each other in whatever it is, uh, whatever project they have to do together. So there's a great sense of unity uh, in his team at work, except when Tuli mentions Jesus. Tuli, she's a very valued and liked member of the team. Uh, she's also quite an outspoken Christian. Uh, she's never rude about it, never pushy, but she does seem to always find ways to, to bring Jesus into conversations, uh, even on Zoom. And often uh, what she has to say about Jesus makes people think. But the one thing that, that everyone in the team really finds strange is how adamant Tuli is that Jesus is the only way anyone can truly know God. Everyone in the team agrees that Tuli uh, is one of the nicest, the most talented, uh, and hardworking and helpful members of the team. So why would someone like Tuli have such intolerant beliefs when it comes to religion? I mean, doesn't Tuli realize that, that she's insulting people on the team, people like Hakim and Adeshni and, and Tabu, who, who, who have different beliefs? Doesn't she actually believe, uh, realize that, that she's insulting Willem? who happens to believe that everyone should be free to believe whatever they want to believe about God. Now, I'm sure most of you, as you listen to that this morning, uh, you can probably identify with someone in that scenario. Um, uh, you might be Willem and his friends who, who have listened to someone uh, like Tuli. Or maybe you're Tuli, who, who's had this conversation with people at work. And, and you know, Jesus has, has many wonderful, very attractive qualities. Jesus said the most amazing things. But there's this one thing about Jesus that really does stick out. He really did claim to be the only way that anyone can know the truth about God. And we shouldn't be confused about that. Jesus could not have made himself clearer. Uh, listen to what he says about himself in John's Gospel. And, and John's Gospel, of course, is, is one of the eyewitness accounts we have of Jesus' words and his life. Listen to what he says in John chapter 14, verse 6. He couldn't be clearer, could he? He says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you had known me, you would know the Father. From now on, you do know him and have seen him. So when Jesus there talks about the Father, he is talking about God. He's referring to the God of the Bible. In verse 8, Philip says to Jesus, he says, show us the Father. And Jesus says to him, whoever has seen me has seen the Father. Jesus could not be clearer. He, he very clearly makes the claim that he is the only way to know the truth about God. And you see these exclusive claims about Jesus made even by his disciples later on. So in Acts chapter 4 verse 12, the apostle Paul, who, who wrote a large uh, part of the, Old, of the New Testament, uh, Paul stands up in, a, in front of a group of religious Jewish religious leaders, and listen to what he says about Jesus. He says, and there is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. In another letter to a young man called Timothy, uh, Paul writes this, 1 Timothy chapter 5, verse 5, he says, for there is one God, and there is one mediator between God and men, the man Jesus Christ, who gave himself as a ransom for all. 
Now, there are many, many more examples like that in the New Testament. And so there must be no doubt in our minds that, that Jesus understood himself to be the only way anyone can know God, the way anyone can be in a right relationship with God. He's the only way. And, and that's the one thing I think about Jesus that, that many people today find so hard to accept. You see, in a world where, where there is such religious diversity and where that diversity is sitting in the same office space and living in the same complex, it seems very unhelpful, doesn't it, to, to claim to be the only truth about God. In fact, today, it's not just considered unhelpful. It is considered to be completely intolerant. Most people would feel today that we've, be, we've moved beyond that kind of thing. We don't think like that anymore. We found a better way. We're better people. We, we can live in harmony with one another. We've found the way of tolerance. It's a very important value in the world today, tolerance. It's the one quality. If you want to be seen as a good person in the eyes of the world, then you must have tolerance and, and a very specific kind of tolerance. It's the kind of tolerance that says everyone, just like Willem, everyone is free to decide for themselves what they believe about God and no one, no one should tell them that they're wrong. The world will not think of you as a good person today unless you think like that, unless that is what you believe uh, about God and, and are tolerant, have those kind of tolerant views. So, in fact, there's a very well-known story that expresses this kind of tolerance. Uh, it's the story of six blind men, and they happen to stumble onto an elephant, uh, as sometimes happens when you're blind. So they stumble onto an elephant, uh, and each of these six men approach the elephant from a different direction, and they begin to touch the elephant. Again, it's a very patient, kind elephant, and he just stands there. And, and the one blind man grabs the elephant trunk, and he says, ah, what we have here is a snake. Uh, and, and the other one grabs a tusk, and he says, no, 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 this is a spear. Uh, and one of, the, one of the, ele the, the blind men is busy stroking the elephant's ear, and he says, no, this is a big leaf. Uh, yet another one is busy hugging the elephant's leg and says, no, this is a beautiful tree. One of them is standing at the side of the elephant, feeding the side of the elephant, and says, it's a big wall. And the last guy is holding the elephant's tail, and he says, you're all wrong, this is a rope. Now, standing, watching all of this is, is a wise old man. And he steps forward and he says to them, guys, stop fighting, relax. You're all feeling the same thing, and what you are feeling is an elephant. Now, you see, friends, that's how the world understands tolerance today. Being tolerant means we all accept that, that no one really knows, uh, and all of us are right, and we cannot tell anyone else that they're wrong. We all kind of, we all believe the same thing, but just in different ways. If you can accept that, well, then we're able to live in harmony with each other. Now, let me say, I can see how that kind of tolerance actually works well at certain levels. So to state the obvious, it works well with elephants. If you really did have a group of six blind people who are busy feeling an elephant, it would be of great help, wouldn't it? If you had an elephant expert who can step into that situation and say, relax, guys, stop fighting. What you are feeling is an elephant. It would be wonderful. Having that elephant expert there would be the key to the whole thing. But you see, friends, it gets a little bit tricky when you try and apply the same kind of thing to God, which is what people try and do today. You see, at first it seems like a really a good way to think about God. You know, surely it's going to lead to a world where everyone gets on well with each other if we can just all agree that everyone is right and no one is wrong. But here's the problem. If you're going to apply the scenario to God, the question you have to answer is, well, who is the wise old man? Who is the one who has that kind of knowledge about God that the old man has about elephants? Who's the God expert? who can step into the situation and say, relax, everyone. I know who God truly is, and you're all worshiping the same God. Who's, who's going to explain that to people? You see, the problem is God's not like an elephant. Human beings can't, you can't study God and know everything there is to know about God and be a God expert the way you can with an elephant. 
If we could do that to God, God would no longer be God. He would be more like an elephant. And so even if we took everything we know, all human beings, and we combined it all and say, this is what we think we know about God, even then, friends, we cannot know God as he truly is. To, to think that we can master God in that way is actually the most supreme arrogance. The thing is, friends, that the tolerance that the world values so highly today is in fact not tolerance at all. It's actually the opposite of what it claims to be. So when you turn around and say to people that the only truth that we must all believe about God is that no one is right or, or no one is wrong and we can't tell each other that we are wrong, can you see what you're doing? You are forcing people to believe one thing about God. It's in fact the height of intolerance. And the problem is, as human beings, we don't have the knowledge or the authority to make that kind of statement. We don't know God in that way. The only one who truly knows all there is to know about God is God himself. He's the only one. He's the only one who's qualified. God is the only God expert. And you see, that is the claim that Jesus makes. He claims to be the God expert because he is God. He's not just a wise man. He's not just a good man. He's God himself. That's the claim of Jesus. He claims to be God. God who's taken on human flesh so that he himself could come and show us who he is and not just show us who he is, but he's come here actually to restore our relationship with him. That's the claim Jesus makes. So I think the best way to try and understand the claims of Jesus is to understand him in the context of the whole Bible. The Bible tells one big story. It claims to be God's story. It's the story of how God created the world right at the very beginning, of how the world then turned its back on God because it decided it was better off without him. And the Bible goes on to explain what a devastating impact that has had on us and, of course, on our relationship with God. And then it goes on to explain how God himself has stepped into that and he has come here himself not just to show us who he is, but to actually restore our relationship with him. That's the story of the whole Bible. And the person of Jesus stands at the center of that story. He's the focal point. He's the fulfillment of the whole story. It is in the historical person of Jesus that God finally and most fully shows himself, shows us who he is. It's through the, through the death and the resurrection of Jesus that God ultimately deals with our greatest problem as he makes peace between us and him. You see, Jesus doesn't just claim to be God. He doesn't just claim to reveal God to us. He doesn't just claim to reconcile us to God. Those, those are easy claims to make. He doesn't just make the claims. Jesus actually does something to back the claims up. And so his whole life, as you read about it in the Bible, like in John's Gospel or one of the other Gospels, his whole life from the, from the moment of his conception to his birth to every word that Jesus speaks, to every action that he does, up to the way that Jesus dies and then physically rises from the dead, all of that, friends, everything we know about Jesus from the Bible was deliberate and it was full of meaning. Every little detail completes and fulfills the story of the Bible. His life, his words, his death, his resurrection, his return to heaven in victory and his promise to one day come back all of that, friends, answers the biggest problem that the Bible says we have, and that's the problem of sin. Sin is the word that the Bible uses to describe the way we have said to God, we want to live in your world, but we want nothing to do with you. We are better off without you. And the, big, the biggest problem with sin, you see, is that God says he cannot ignore it. God can't ignore it because he understands that not only does sin seek to destroy him and who he is, but actually sin ultimately wants to destroy everything good that he has made. And God simply will not allow that to happen. And so the Bible makes it very clear. God hates sin. He is totally intolerant of sin. And sin ultimately leads to death and God will destroy sin and death. And you see, that's how we must understand Jesus. Everything about his life, death, resurrection, his, his ascension, and one day his return 
is about making sure, it's God making sure that we are not destroyed when God finally destroys sin in his world. You see, as you think about it, Jesus actually gives us a very different way of understanding tolerance because Jesus gives us a very different way of understanding love. Isn't that the kind of tolerance we would want in the world? A tolerance that is motivated by true love. And some people might say, but that is the tolerance we seek. Surely it's a loving thing to say to people, look, just get on. You all believe the same thing. There's no need to fight. Well, friends, it might seem that way, but Jesus actually gives us something better. He gives us a much more powerful definition of tolerance because he gives us a much more powerful love. Listen how John describes it again in his gospel. John chapter 3, verse 16. It says this, For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him in the Son shall not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. Whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe stands condemned already because they have not believed in the name of God's one and only Son. Now, As people look at those verses, of course, their attention is going to go to the last sentence, which has none of the tolerance that the world values so much. It's very plain there, doesn't it? It says very plainly that whoever does not believe in Jesus stands condemned before God. There is no tolerance here for another way to God. The only way to avoid God's condemnation is to believe in Jesus. But you see, all of that flows from verse 16. It's rooted in the most powerful, selfless, sacrificial love the world has ever known or will ever know. It's a sacrificial love, a love that motivated Jesus to willingly lay down his life for those who are dying. Jesus came into the world to die to save the world. He died for us to do for us what we cannot do for ourselves and and what no one else can do for us. Jesus died in our place. He died for us. Jesus takes God's judgment onto himself so that we can know God's forgiveness. And only Jesus could do that. You see, because only Jesus is perfectly human and perfectly God at the same time. And John says here, he says, Jesus did not come into the world to condemn it. Do you notice that? He came to save it. Friends, Jesus is the most tolerant person you will ever meet. As you read the Gospels, you meet a Jesus who accepts everyone. Jesus spent most of his time on earth with people that no one else would tolerate. He spent his time with corrupt people, people with very low levels of integrity. He spent his time with prostitutes, with liars, and with thieves. Jesus spent his time with dirty beggars, with sick people. The thing about Jesus, friends, is that he didn't come into the world to kind of set up a system of of rules and beliefs that are designed to condemn people who don't look like him and behave like him and and come from his culture or or speak his language. That's not what Jesus did. Jesus simply came to save people from sin and death. And he will do that for anyone. He has such a powerful love for people that he's willing to lay down his life for anyone. And you see, because he loves people so much, he loved them enough to tell them that. He loved them enough to tell them there is no other way. I am the only way to know God and to be right with God. It doesn't matter who you are. It doesn't matter what you have done or haven't done. It doesn't matter what you believe. Jesus says to everyone and anyone, come to me. I am the only one who can do this for you. And he loves you enough to tell you that. Now the sad truth is that those who have been saved by Jesus don't always behave like Jesus. It is true, isn't it, that Christians can sometimes be incredibly intolerant in a very bad way. We can give the impression that God only accepts people who who are like us, who look like us, talk like us, behave like us. Sometimes we talk about Jesus in a way that makes people think that Jesus was incredibly intolerant and judgmental. I want to say if that has been your experience, or if you have always just assumed 
that Jesus is just intolerant in a very bad way, then, then what I would encourage you to do is rather find out about him for yourself. Go to the source. Go to the Bible. Take the opportunity to meet him as he makes himself known on the pages of the Bible. Now, one of the best ways you can do that is actually next week. Start, start next week. Join us on Sunday as Royden opens up the Bible of Hebrews and Jesus will literally walk off the pages of the book of Hebrews. And you'll meet him for yourself. You, you could also maybe join one of our home groups. Uh, they meet every week. Small group of people read the Bible together and you are free to ask your questions and have a discussion and get to know Jesus as he is in the Bible. You see, friends, the one thing that I want you to avoid is the worst kind of intolerance at all, of all. And that is the intolerance that says I'm unwilling to listen to Jesus. I, I don't want to give him a hearing at all. I'm not interested. There is the danger that maybe you have already in your own heart and mind decided that, that, that you think you know who God is, that God is who you think he is, and that, and that you get to treat God the way you want to treat him, and he must treat you the way you decide he must treat you. That is a great danger. It's dangerous to think that you can tell God who he is and that you can tell him where you stand with him. And so I want you to avoid that danger and avoid that intolerance and be willing to listen to Jesus as he walks off the pages of the Bible. Of course, some of you might have moved further down that road. And maybe this morning, you've, you've, you've kind of got to that point in your life already, maybe through a series of events, uh, including what you've heard this morning, and you've realized that's exactly what I've done. And that, that realization is dawning on you. You realize that for whatever reasons you may have had, you've actually just, you've rejected Jesus. You've wanted nothing to do with him. You've said Jesus goes too far when he says, I'm the only way. I'm not willing to accept that. And maybe you've realized this morning that's a mistake. Maybe God is beginning to help you to understand that the only way you can know who he truly is, the only way that your relationship with him can be right is if you, if you listen to Jesus and what Jesus says about himself. Maybe this morning what God is starting to do is he's already started to break down the intolerance that is in your heart and mind towards Jesus and what God says about himself through Christ. And so what I want to do is I don't, I don't want to miss this opportunity. And so I want to say to you, if that is, is what's happening in your life, then, then respond to God. In a sense, God has started the conversation with you. So why don't you respond by speaking to him? And, and you do that simply by praying. And maybe you don't know what to say. And so what I want to do is, as we close, I just, I'm going to pray a very simple prayer and that prayer will be on the screen. And, and if you want to say something to God about this, maybe pray these words after me. You can pray them out loud if you want to, or, or if you want to just pray them quietly in your heart and mind, that's fine as well. The, the, the words will be on the screen. So, so let's pray together. Obviously, don't close your eyes if you want to pray this as you read the words. But let's pray this together. Dear God, I realize that I have decided for myself who you are and where I stand with you. I have lived my life based on who I think you should be. I realize that Jesus is who he says he is. He is God, and you have made yourself known to me through him. I realize that only Jesus can fix my relationship with you. Please help me to trust in his life, death, and resurrection. Amen. Well, can I just say, if, if you prayed that prayer, or even if you just want to continue the conversation and speak to someone, I encourage you to, to go to the church website, and the first page you will see is the My Story page, uh, and on that page is a, is a contact card or a response card where you can fill in your details, uh, and someone from the church will just give you a call and make... Uh, uh, make contact with you just to, if you want to speak to someone, maybe pray with someone, if you have more questions, please do go and fill in that response card on the website. Well, thank you for listening, and I hope you have a great week.